We're going to begin this morning, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Hazel Henderson. Uh, Hazel's revolutionary economic ideas have successfully challenged traditional economic views, convincing governments to adopt more sustainable, environmental, and people-friendly economic policies. Today, Dr. Henderson is a world-renowned futurist, evolutionary economist, environmentalist, and television producer, um, and uh, with published books and a globally syndicated newspaper column uh, with editorials appearing in more than 400 newspapers and 27 languages. Hazel's actively promoted ethical investing as a way to transform the current economic system, co-founded Via3Net, a British online alternative sustainable commerce portal, and has developed an index which more accurately measures the quality of life than traditional economic indicators. Um, and um, I'd like you all to welcome Hazel Henderson. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. So first of all, I have to say what an incredible honor it is for me to be on the Founders Circle for the Public Banking Institute and to serve on its advisory board. The Public Banking Institute is an incredibly important innovation in public policy, and it's just an honor for me to be here with you this morning and uh, some of you may know that I've been focusing on the big transition, I think, that's going on on this planet from the fossil fuel era to what I call the solar age. So what I want to talk about today is how do we bankroll this transition. So uh, I really do believe there is a planetary whole system shift going on. It's uh, accelerating due to the increased interconnection, the crises of global financialization, the money printing bubble, the impacts of the global industrial model, which of course has led to all the resource depletion, and the expansion of scientific knowledge and the rise of human awareness, and the information sharing now by citizens across boundaries which led to the incredible innovation of the Occupy Wall Street movement, which of course is worldwide. So back in 1981, I wrote about this great transition I thought was happening in my book, The Politics of the Solar Age. And I uh, went to my physicist friend, Fritjof Papra, uh, to do a forward because uh, we really need to think about the physical sciences rather than all of those abstract models uh, that economists use. And so let's just remind ourselves where we are uh, in this solar system and that our mother star, the sun, provides us with this enormous flow of free photons every day and it dwarfs as you can see from this diagram all of the current energy that we use mostly uh, dug out of the ground and so what I think humans are doing right now is looking up and realizing my gosh why don't we use the free photon and we can learn from plants to figure out how to do this with their technology of photosynthesis. So the redesign revolution is on, as my dear friend, the late Mr. Fuller, used to say. And we are in a state of abundance if we look at it properly. And so all of our economic models are about scarcity and uh, that leads, of course, to fear and competition and uh, all of the dysfunction that's going on right now with all of the austerity and, you know, all of that story. So 
if we realize that the abundance comes from two sources, the free photon every day, and also the geothermal energy that the core of our planet provides, and the other part of the abundance is how humans in community mutually uh, sharing and caring and, and, uh, and growing together um, can lead to a much more abundant society than the one that economic textbooks talk about where each individual is uh, trying to maximize their self-interest in competition with everybody else. So the redesign revolution means that everyone can contribute. We're talking about new forms of governance, much more participatory democracy. Public banking is a key part of this future. And so is redesigning the money supply. And this is why Ellen Brown has been so brilliant. Um, she has been my teacher on the intricacies of money supply and her in her wonderful book, um, uh, uh, The um, Web of Debt. So in the meantime, for many, many years, I have been looking at the, uh, on the ground, in communities, at the new currencies, the time banking, the credit unions, and I always considered them a leading economic indicator of how dysfunctional central banking was at any particular point. And any time central bankers have been really dysfunctional, local communities, particularly in North America, but we see it all around the world, simply say, okay, if the big croupier at the Fed is not issuing uh, enough money supply, We'll just simply create our own currencies and clear our own markets. And uh, this has been going on uh, for many, many years and was particularly evident uh, ju just at the time of the Great Depression where um, thousands of new local currencies popped up all around North America. And uh, I footnoted the amazing book uh, that photographed all of these currencies, one of my most precious books. So today we find crowdfunding, which was just approved uh, in the Congress and signed by President um, Obama, um, to really enable small investors who were shut out of most of the uh, capital raising done in the official way on Wall Street and covered by the SEC, and so now crowdfunding is uh, legal happening, um, and uh, I think that uh, it's very interesting that a lot of my friends who, um, I, whose work I really respect are very, very worried about crowdfunding. But in the, in the, the later, we can talk about this, and I hope we will. So the basic understanding is that money is information. And money is not scarce. And mostly you have to say that a couple of times because we have it so drilled into us that money is scarce. And every public policy pronouncement that anybody makes, like for example right now about the student debt problem, is where will we get the money? So you see, the politics of money, money creation, is absolutely key to understanding our current situation. And uh, I love the Move Our Money movement because this is making people aware of the politics of money. And at the same time, because of the internet, we now have the new sharing peer-to-peer -peer Wikinomics as uh, written by Don Tapscott in his wonderful books, Wikinomics and the Macroeconomics. And what Don is describing is the open source movement and how uh, people in that uh, computer uh, movement uh, love to share their work. And they volunteer gladly uh, because it's part of their own personal growth. And so the peer-to-peer -peer 
uh, new unpaid sharing part of our economy is now joining together with what I have been studying all my life, which I call the love economy. And they are the unpaid 50% of all of the, of the work that goes on uh, in OECD countries. Uh, and that is raising children, managing households, serving on the school board, taking care of elders, and, and so on and so forth. And of course, because it's unpaid, it's simply missing from GDP. And the United Nations Human Development Index first estimated the size globally of this love uh, economy uh, at 16 trillion with a T, 11 trillion provided by the world's women, and 5 trillion by the world's men, and of course simply missing from global GDP. So you can go on the UNDP website and, uh, and look at that study. And so the other design revolution going on is eco-designing of products and uh, generally used uh, under the title biomimicry. And all that means really is learning how nature has been successful in innovating over 3.8 billion years to um, allow the survival of all uh, life forms. So redesigning money, and that's what Ellen Brown has been um, such a leader in. And I totally agree that we need a publicly created money supply. We have to democratize credit. Um, for example, in most of the advanced democracies and many other countries, students um, and a higher education are simply government funded as public goods. And here we have the absurd situation in the US of student debt just reaching the trillion dollar mark. And when you look at the absurdity of all the free money, um, last time I looked, you know, it was about seven trillion um, that was printed by the Fed to give to Wall Street and uh, creating this carry trade where they turned right around and invested in treasuries um, and um, made uh, a, a, an easy profit. At the same time, we're saying that we cannot educate the next generation. What utter absurdity. And similarly, our infrastructure needs to be publicly financed. And there, the lesson of the Bank of North Dakota, which Ellen has helped us all understand, is a good one. So what we're doing really is we're all bypassing Wall Street. <laughs> and um, that word disintermediation has been the hallmark of the uh, Internet revolution. And it's changed media, it's changed uh, many, many centralized uh, sectors of our economy. And of course, it was bound to change Wall Street as well. So I'm all for public banks for states and cities. And having the Treasury issue our currency uh, without uh, the publicly um, determined uh, infrastructure projects, at least. Uh, without uh, interest and without going to uh, Wall Street uh, to do those bond issues that they make so much money out of. Uh, so I would agree with, um, Ron, with a lot of what Ron Paul says about the Fed. And it's interesting to me that um, Ron Paul and Bernie Sanders um, pretty much agree, along with Dennis Kucinich. So it's not a left-right issue. Um, I hope all of you read Sheila Bear's wonderful editorial last week in the Washington Post. The Sheila Bear plan, she had her tongue in her cheek. <laughs> she was saying, okay, um, if Bernanke can print all that free money and give it to the big banks on Wall Street, um, why don't we just do that for everybody? Do read the article. It's incredibly funny, but she's making a very important point. And so I would just say, uh, I'm backing Ellen Brown for Treasury Secretary, okay? <laughs> so 
My uh, whole approach to economics is very simple, really, and I got it down to a three-layer cake. Um, and if you look at the top two layers, the private sector and the public sector, uh, they are the only parts of the economy which economists look at because they are monetized. And underneath are those two lower layers which economists miss. And they are, of course, the love economy, 50% uh, of all productive activity which is unpaid. And the whole thing rests on the productivity of Mother Nature. And we all know that if you have a map of only half the territory, uh, you're not going to make very good policy. And so what the economics profession has done has simply blinded itself to those two lower layers. And they've been referred to as, quote, unquote, externalities. And there's a Freudian slip, if ever I heard one. Yeah. So this is one of the reasons why ethical markets, uh, our company, um, started the Transforming Finance Initiative. And um, with uh, the help of our friend John Fullerton, who I hope is still there, and if you're, I, I know you made a speech yesterday, John, but anyway, uh, thank you for participating in this uh, meeting as well. So uh, what we did, we came up with a statement, it's only about three pages, and we would love you to all go and uh, join the site at, uh, at the website, which is listed there, transformingfinance.net. And most importantly for this meeting, uh, we uh, reasserted the truth that finance is part of the global commons. And this has been tacitly recognized, of course, uh, since Bretton Woods in 1945. Now, while we have now the biggest blockage to progress, I believe, is uh, the need to update portfolio analysis. And this, um, since we have now about globally 120 trillion with a T uh, in institutional investors, uh, um, pension funds, uh, charities, uh, and all of those uh, uh, private um, institutions, uh, they are still being managed by the traditional efficient markets, rational actors, risk metrics, and all of that. And so that is the old herd behavior, which is still sort of seeking alpha um, competitively with all of the other fund managers. But they're all using obsolete asset allocation models and the obsolete curricula in business schools, which produce the crash, really, has a, a lot to do with um, the most recent crash in 2008. But the model simply were found wanting. We also have the agent principle conflicts of interest, which our friend Professor Paul Woolley at the London School of Economics has been examining. And the agent principle problem is very well known in corporations, but never really been applied to uh, these big institutional portfolios. And what happens in this case is that the asset managers and the uh, consultants sort of run away with the game, and they intimidate the asset owners and the trustees. And so uh, I've talked to many of my friends who um, are trustees, for example, of public uh, employee pension funds, and they say, uh, we go to our portfolio managers and say, uh, gee, here's some wonderful little companies in uh, energy efficiency or solar or wind energy. And the asset manager always says, oh, no, no, you don't understand. They're much too risky. And so this has created tremendous blockage and, of course, enormous subsidies to fossil fuels, nuclear, ethanol, and all those stranded assets, um, which uh, are the proven reserves of fossil fuels, which what happened really is that uh, those fossil fuels can never actually be lifted um, without um, causing uh, unacceptable global warming. So, um, so basically, 
what we've been doing at Ethical Market since 2007 um, is tracking all the private investments that just went into solar and renewable uh, companies. And our current total, uh, just released uh, and in February, is now 3.3 trillion or worldwide in these green sectors, renewable energy, green buildings, efficiency, smart grid, clean technology, and corporate R&D. And so what we are recommending is that those institutional investors and pension funds shift at least 10% of their assets to away from the hedge funds and the dark pools and the high frequency trading and, you know, the commodity ETFs uh, into um, real green investment. And uh, MRSA, the MRSA and IFI report, uh, actually doubles us when they say that these institutional investors should shift 40% of their assets and half to hedge on risks of climate change and environment, uh, and the other half to capitalize on opportunities in the green sector. So our model simply is the lowest entropy, production and consumption, dematerializing total economic output, and reducing the throughput of energy and materials through better science and knowledge. That's why we need these students to get properly educated. And moving towards nature's biomimicry models. So why do we say 10 trillion by 2020? Well, we use a computer model by some friends of ours in Australia. And what they're saying is that um, if we keep investing at the current rate, which is about 10 trillion, I mean, which is about 1 trillion each year already going into the green sectors, that by 2020, we will have started leaving the fossil fuel age and we will be moving into the solar age. And we have found all of these reports. There's a hundred of them that uh, um, I footnoted in our latest report. Pretty much agree with us. And so lastly, um, we have been doing surveys, which we call Beyond GDP, with GlobeScan in London, and uh, we have found huge majorities in 12 countries that actually agree that we should shift away from GDP and purely economic measures of progress and move to multidisciplinary systems approaches, such as we do at the Calvert Henderson Quality of Life Indicators, and now the OECD is doing with its Better Life uh, Index. We actually don't need macroeconomics anymore to look at quality of life and real progress. So I have um, been writing about this for a long time, and uh, I am just delighted to be with you, and now let's open it up. Uh, let me add one more thing. We have um, a, uh, a, uh, an award that we give, along with the World Business Academy and the University of Notre Dame, called Ethic Mark because we're trying to raise the bar on advertising. And uh, so if you have any nominations of advertising campaigns that really uplift the human spirit in society, please nominate them, and uh, we'll try to give them an award. So again, thank you very much. And uh, now let's have some discussion if we can. Thank you. Um, we have time for just uh, just a couple of questions. So, um, Sergio, you want to give the first question? If you could come up here um, and stand at the podium and ask Hazel, uh, are you hearing us okay, Hazel? Yes. Okay, yes, great. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'm going to have the questioner stand right here so they can look right at you. Thank you. Hey, hey. Sergio. <laughs> How are you, Hazel? <laughs> so good to see you, my friend. Likewise. I, I, I was wondering, uh, Ellen yesterday explained that about 
40% of the banks are public around the world, but we do not have an indicator about how they perform in their own societies. So I wonder if you, I know you're busy, but if you can create one more economic indicator to tell us how banks are doing, how members, uh, how good citizens, how members of their society about uh, financing infrastructure, financing education, and all the things that we need in order to have a better society. And if you would be willing to share that information with us next time we get together. <laughs> well, it's very much needed, Sergio. But uh, the thing is that uh, I think that um, really uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement now is beginning to open up this national debate that we really have to have. It's not just about creating indicators. We really have to see where the general public is. And, um, and so we hope one day when we get the money out of politics that we'll be able to have a real democratic discussion uh, that will clarify this. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Uh, any other questions for Hazel at the moment? We've got time for one more. Okay, uh, Michael, why don't you come up? Hello, Hazel. It's been a long time. I used to go to the World Future Society and hear your talks there in the early 80s and mid 80s. I can't hear you very well. Can okay. You speak up? Can you hear me now? That's better. Okay. Uh, I used to go to the World Future Society and hear your talks there in the mid 80s and eight or late 80s. And I'm really sorry, I can't hear you. Okay. Speak towards the laptop. Towards the laptop? Okay. Can you hear me? Try now? that. Can you hear me now? Now I can. Great. <laughs> I used to go to the World Future Society and hear your talks in the mid 80s and early 80s. So that's how I got to know you. And um, just one question before the bigger question uh, How's Frank Feather? Oh my gosh, I have not talked to Frank Feather for some time. Uh, we used to meet at World Future Society meetings, but I haven't been going to them lately. Um, but um, if you have been in touch with Frank, please give him my best and tell him to be in touch. Uh, well, I haven't been in touch with him either. It's been a long time. <laughs> but uh, he used to be quite a, quite a, a, a radical speaker at the, at the conferences in Washington. Uh, I'm did sorry, you hear that? I can't hear you again. Okay. Uh, I have not seen Frank in a long time, but he was quite a radical speaker at the conferences. Big question. Yes, okay. he certainly was. We agreed right. about a lot of things. Yeah. Now, the big question I'm very concerned about global warming. I've spoken to many environmental scientists about this crisis, and many feel we have already passed the tipping point. So, what do we do? That basically. We have 20 years, 30 years at best. Even if we cut all emissions today, it may be too late. Well, um, when I look at the whole system transition going on on this planet, I think there are many tipping points, many different tipping points uh, with uh, different time frames. I would say that we have uh, gone over some tipping points um, but not all. And mm -hmm. here I just have to speak as a mother and a grandmother. And, uh, and my feeling is that all my life has been about just working as hard as I can to uh, shift us in the right direction. And basically, um, I have to just uh, keep on doing what I'm doing uh, rather than um, being um, in despair. Because I think really that our future is so bright if we really shift to understand, understand the abundance on this, uh, on this little planet um, and the opportunities we have to create abundant societies in harmony with nature. I mean, you know, the population people try to scare us 
and all the projections are there's going to be 9 billion members of the human family by 2050? I don't think so. I agree with my friend Ashok Kosla, who is the co-president of um, our association of the Club of Rome. And he points out uh, in a very careful computer model that if we gave uh, the world women very, very small solar panels to allow them to uh, learn at night and start little businesses, that that could very easily lead to three billion avoided births because women do not wish to have all of these children. And the moment women get a chance to be educated and to be fully um, empowered, guess what? They stop having children. It goes down to uh, between one and two children. So I look at those scenarios and say they are totally in the control of human beings. And so um, that's what gives me hope. Okay, thank you very much, Hazel. It was so nice talking to you again. Nice talking to you. Hazel, uh, thank you again for joining us this morning. Uh, thank you. And Have a wonderful day and tomorrow, and uh, thanks again for letting me come in this way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we have a very special guest next, and um, uh, so everyone stay in your seats um, because um, I'm going to introduce him here as soon as I do uh, a few technical details. And um, so, uh, you know, yesterday we were, um, <coughs> uh, as soon as I get rid of my webcam here. There we go. Okay, there I am. So you remember yesterday we, we were in the hall, there was a, uh, a meditation, and um, we were kind of tuning in to the Quakers and the Pennsylvania Colony and the first public bank. And, and so we seem to have tuned into a, a time warp here. And we have a visitor uh, from those earlier days that uh, uh, joined us uh, and um, has a, uh, oh, I'm going to take this, take them both up. Okay. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> 